Welcome to the webinar to discuss the paper, The U.S. Immigration Courts, Dumping Ground for the Nation System, the Nation's Systemic Immigration Failure, the Causes, Composition, and Politically Difficult Solutions to the Court Backlog, authored by Don Kerwin and Evan Millett. Today, we have several distinguished experts to discuss the findings and recommendations of this uh, important report. <clears throat> and I will, I will list the speakers and then have them speak in turn. First will be Don Kerwin, who's the author and editor. Uh, he's the author of the report and editor of the Journal of Migration and Human Security, and he's the former executive director of the Center for Migration Studies of New York. Second will be Evan Millett, who is the co-author of the report and a former data and policy analyst <clears throat> for the Center of Migration Studies. Third will be Mimi Zankoff, who's the president of the National Association of Immigration Judges. And last but not least will be Professor Richard Boswell, professor of law at UC Hastings College of Law in San Francisco. Once we have heard from the speakers, I will call upon anyone from the expert advisory group who's on the call who might wanna make a short comment. Then we'll go to questions and answers and please put your questions in the Q&A box, <clears throat> if you will. So now I call on Don to lead us off. Welcome, Don. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin, I, I know that Mimi is here with us just for 10 minutes or so. Should we start with her? I don't know what your time is like, Mimi. I have until about, like I've got about a half an hour right now. So my okay. understanding was that you were gonna present first and maybe I was going to go second just so I make it to my okay. doctor on time. That's great. great. We'll do Thank it that you. way. Yeah. So hi everybody. I mean, the study is really the product of a long engagement, you know, with our expert advisory group, and it's great to have so many of them with us today. Thanks uh, to them. Thanks to the EOIR for clarifying some of the statistical and data issues that we had during this process. I mean, in this report, what we try to do is explain the causes of a backlog that's approaching two million pending cases now and that will continue to grow if it's not strongly addressed. We also try to set forth solutions to reversing the backlog and reconstituting our immigration court system. So let me start with two overarching takeaways um, from the report, and then I'll outline five sets of recommendations quickly. I won't cover anything in depth here. Uh, on takeaways first, I mean, we found that the immigration courts, which are administered by the Executive Office for Immigration Review, or EOIR, are really not at all to blame for the backlog. The backlog instead is a function of problems in the broader U.S. immigration system, problems like disparities in funding between immigration enforcement and adjudication, Visa backlogs of 4 million cases right now. Some of those in those visa backlogs are also in the court backlogs. The very limited authorities of immigration judges to manage their own dockets, the location of the Executive Office for Immigration Review and a law enforcement agency. And its treatment is an adjunct of the nation's um, uh, Homeland Security Agency and the failure to pass immigration reform legislation over many decades at this point. Thus, our paper calls the immigration courts the dumping grounds for the nation's systemic immigration failures. And the backlog is really a casualty of the status quo, kind of an emblem of it too. The second takeaway is that the backlog is not a small problem. It works real harm on the immigration system overall and on all the people who are subject to it. It delays relief in strong cases and delays the disposition of weaker cases as well. As a result, it undermines the integrity of the system as a whole, including the immigration enforcement system. It also makes it more difficult to secure legal representation, which hurts immigrants and it hurts the courts. This is a long report with lots of data, analysis and recommendations, but let me walk through kind of five of them uh, quite quickly. First, we argue that Congress should appropriate funding for several hundred additional immigration judges, related legal staff, and for all of EOIR operations. The paper offers various staffing scenarios based on different projections related to case receipts and case completions. In 2022, EOIR's appropriation represented around just 3% 
of the combined budgets of CBP and ICE, that is the two DHS enforcement agencies, which channel most of the cases into the immigration courts. The report proposes benchmarking EOIR's funding at 6% of the CBP and ICE budgets, roughly twice of EOIR's current budget. Second, DHS should exercise greater discipline by initiating removal proceedings that reflect meaningful enforcement priorities, and it should exercise prosecutorial discretion as well. DHS should limit serving notices to appear, those are the charging documents that initiate removal proceedings, to a number below the number that the courts can realistically adjudicate in a given year. It really serves nobody's interest to flood the courts with low priority cases that they can't complete. Moreover, DHS should vest responsibility for pre-screening cases with ICE's Office of Principal Legal Advisor, or OPLA, whose attorneys serve as de, de facto prosecutors in these cases. OPLA attorneys should also work with immigration judges to close and to terminate low priority cases in cases that the courts don't need to adjudicate, such as those of persons with petitions for permanent residence before US citizenship and immigration services. EOIR reports that the backlog includes more than 40,000 cases in which there was a past court adjournment due to an application pending at USCIS. However, this figure includes only respondents who notified the court of their pending applications, thus the numbers likely much larger. DHS could also exercise prosecutorial discretion for people uh, who have been in backlogs for long periods EOIR reported to us that 731,149 cases have been pending for at least three years and 277,000 for at least five years. Third, Congress needs to reform the underlying immigration system. It would relieve pressure on the courts and the enforcement sister system to align the US legal immigration system with the nation's labor, family, and other needs to a, a greater degree than it is aligned. In addition, a legalization program would reduce the number of US residents subject to removal proceedings, most of whom have long tenure and strong ties in the United States. Congress should also pass legislation to reduce visa backlogs, which would help reduce court backlogs. Finally, it should establish a statute of limitations for ordinary civil immigration violations. As it stands, DHS can initiate removal proceedings for illegal entries that occurred decades in the past. That doesn't make any sense. Fourth is Judge Sankoff will discuss Congress should establish an immigration court under Article I, Section 8 of the US Constitution as a way to increase the court's independence, funding, prestige, and other values. This reform would be a clear improvement. By contrast, the status quo has led, for example, to the reassignment of immigration judges, mostly to the border, even when most of the newly undocumented over the last decade have been people that have overstayed their temporary visas and haven't crossed the border. Many reassigned judges reported having little work to do in their temporary positions, while tens of thousands of their hearings at home needed to be rescheduled, many of them years into the future. Fifth, immigration judges lack many of the authorities that criminal court and administrative judges, court judges uh, enjoy. Imagine a court system with limited discretion to resolve cases based on equitable considerations, with no statute of limitations for underlying offenses, with no plea bargaining, with no contempt authority, and no legal representation for a high percentage of respondents whereas the government's uniformly represented by paid counsel. These unique characteristics of the immigration courts make it very difficult to resolve and close cases. Addressing these problems will help increase efficiency and reduce the backlog. To conclude, many of the broader problems in the US immigration system seem impervious to reform for the last several months issue such as reducing the backlog might be the right way to begin to remedy these past failures. It would really be poetic justice if the backlog, which has been caused by the failure to reform the US immigration system became the impetus for doing just that. In any event, the nation needs an immigration court that fairly and efficiently adjudicates cases. 
It's hard to imagine staging a viable response to the hundreds of thousands of cases of asylum seekers, humanitarian parolees, and other recent arrivals without reversing the backlog and addressing this in a serious way. The alternative will ultimately satisfy nobody who cares about these issues. Thank you. Thank you, Don. Um, I'm going to call on Evan Millett, who is a co-author of the report. Evan, you looked closely at the kind of staff levels and number of judges that would be needed to reverse the backlog. Can you can you give, share with us what you found and any other statistical issues you might want to raise? Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Uh, so uh, we looked at you know uh, various things, but CMS mainly projected the number of judges needed to eliminate the backlog under two scenarios based on different assumptions related to the number of future case receives and case completions per judge. The first scenario uses a 10-year average, and the second scenario considers the historically high number of new cases seen in 2022. Under either scenario, the number of judges needed far exceeds the number of judges that EOIR has on board. So it would require 870 judges in order to eliminate the backlog in 10 years under the first scenario and 1,790 judges in the second scenario. And to eliminate the backlog in five years, they would need 1,184 judges in the first scenario and 2,152 in the second scenario. So it's likely the upper projection, uh, projections are more accurate based on the recent numbers of case receipts from 2022 and uh, this year. So we would also look at what would happen if uh, 200 judges were added each year and found that it would take six years to eliminate the backlog in the first scenario and 12 years in the second scenario. So noting that these are very strong assumptions, the projections highlight the need for DHS to exercise prosecutorial discretion and reduce referrals to a uh, court system as part of a comprehensive plan to effectively address, address the backlog. Uh, so I will pass it back to you, Kevin. I know uh, Mimi is on a schedule, so I'm uh, in the background here if any other uh, questions come up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Evan. So now we'll turn to, to Judge Sankoff. Thank you for being here and your tight schedule. We appreciate it. Thank you so much, Kevin, Don, and for all the members of this group. I'm so honored to have been able to contribute to this um, excellent and well-researched report, and I'm honored to be here today. I'm speaking in my capacity as president of the National Association of Immigration Judges. And I wanted to just give you a little bit of color to uh, you know, add a little more color to this excellent and well-researched report. Um, by giving you the perspective of a judge who's been seated in, uh, you know, on the bench for 16 years now and is currently seated in New York. So as we know, there are only about 700 immigration judges hearing cases at the roughly 700 courts around the country. And boy, Evan Millett's um, statistics and projections are so significant when I consider those numbers that she just set forth and what are we are today. Generally, as you know, judges are really on the bench almost every day, all day. And it seems like no matter how hard they're working, that backlog just keeps growing at what we're at um, over two, 2 million cases right now, which is about 3,500 cases per judge. You know, it's an enormous amount of work, um, at, no matter how hard you how hard you spin your wheels. So why have we reached this point? Uh, we've reached this point in large part, in our view, at NAIJ because the courts are housed within the Department of Justice. And we answer to a political leader, the Attorney General, who's also the nation's chief prosecutor. And because of that, the DOJ's control over the courts has yielded these extreme pendulum swings that we heard about. You know, our judges are supposed to be apolitical, but they are reeling as they navigate their judicial responsibilities on the one hand and this heavy political scrutiny, which is their reality on the other hand. It's that ping pong between these administration's priorities that reduces judicial effectiveness. And that's because the priority for one attorney general, as we know, might be completing the oldest cases. And for another, it might be recent arrivals requiring travel to the border, as you heard Don mention a few moments ago. Um, our ability to complete these cases is truly a function of those shifting priorities. And whatever isn't a priority gets shoved to the back of the line. And, and my part of that backlog grows. So as that backlog pressure has been, having repercussions for, ju for judges um, who view the DOJ, uh, well, the DOJ views us as attorneys, attorney employees, 
And amid those political swings, you know, those judges could be staring down possibly a poor performance rating, not because they don't know how to do their job, but because the agency they work for has shifted its priorities. Or suddenly court resources are de deprioritized and the budget for interpreters, for example, dries up. How can that be in an immigration court? You need interpreters every day, all day, multiple ones. Um, plans for our new IT system improvements got put on the back burner at one point. Training conferences get canceled, staffing levels stagnate, files stack up unfiled, space needs aren't addressed. So repeatedly, we know that the Department of Justice's Office of Inspector General and this agent has found that the agency over years, not just one administration, just over years has mismanaged resources. I was uh, truly impressed by the audacity of the title of this report. <laughs> because I thought I was going far when we say that we're treated as the stepchild within the DOJ. But it's truly a problem for all that look at this issue. The problems are compounded for judges like, like me who presides over a family unit docket where we have many unrepresented juveniles and it takes really extra time to try to address the, the needs of this vulnerable population. DOJ has tried to implement solutions over the years. For example, they, they made an effort to modernize the court back in 2001. It said it needed to move away paper files and adopt a digital filing system that the public could use to interact with, with the court, much like PACER at the US courts. But DOJ didn't decide that they wanted to use that off the shelf product like PACER. Instead, they just finalized the national rollout of their own ECAS system. But that system has challenges, problems, whether it's going to be able to meet the current needs of the courts is a, a valid question. It's no small task to try to, to run as many courts all around the country as we have. So the, what I'm trying to convey is that DOJ's solutions um, sometimes have exacerbated our problems. And it's the Department of Justice has undermined the integrity of the court because there's, there's this politicization that has led to infringement on judicial independence. Every administration we know imposes its political will on the courts. And it's not, this isn't a political statement. It's a statement of fact. It can be applied to every administration we work for in both parties. But today the mission of the DOJ simply doesn't align with the mission of a court of law. The courts are supposed to be independent from all external pressures, they're not. Um, we need an independent immigration court. It's good government. It would legitimize the integrity of the immigration court outcomes and it would support the rule of law. I was so pleased to see that it was the, um, the, uh, you know, one of the recommendations of uh, this this wonderful report that's just come out, um, it would be directly it would allow the judges to be re directly responsible for our dockets. It would ensure that the resources are applied where they're needed most, and that the courtrooms would be able to function more eff effectively and efficiently. It would give us the ability to shed this politically tinged system that we operate in, um, and start enabling the judges to function as the judges that they're supposed to be. So thank you so much for the uh, opportunity to convey these ideas and for doing the deep dive on these very, very difficult uh, problems that are facing our, our Department of Justice and our court system. I'm happy to answer any questions at some point if there are any. Thank you, Judge. And last, uh, our last speaker is Professor Boswell. Welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for 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 being here, and I really enjoyed uh, um, working with the um, with the other esteemed um, colleagues who were uh, on this panel of experts. And particularly thanks to to, to Don and, and Evan and and others at uh, CMS for 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 the great work that's been done here. I mean, we cannot. I don't think we, there's any way to understate the problem that's facing this entire system. Um, and and also to recognize what I, what I appreciate about the report is that it was a very honest report and a very detailed report and provided some really um, helpful recommendations. But let's not be um, you know, naive about this. That there's really no silver bullet uh, to, to this um, problem that we're confronting other than serious reform of the system. And I think that's the one, one of the really important things that's, that's highlighted here is that this offers a, a a a blueprint for some from really, you know, dealing with the the, the core problems that are facing the immigration system. Um, and and just to start off, I'll be very brief here, but I th I think to start off with is that reform has to be guided by uh, an agreed set of principles that are based on a consensus around morality and ju and and justice. 
Um, and if you don't start with that, I think then all of the other things become very difficult to do. Because the visa shortages that we're talking about, um, and the, the visa shortages that we're talking about are really on the on both the immigrant immigrant side as well as the non-immigrant side. Um, and it's been a problem that we've been facing for many, 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 many decades. It's because of the um, the system that we have is is really a very antiquated one, and it's not based upon a, a modern worldview about what migration is is about. Um, and if we don't deal with those particular problems, we're going to continue to see this what we're seeing here, you know, in, in the immigration courts, um, as you know, this is going to continue to to to, to daunt us. And the immigration court reforms that are that are that are offered. Are really critical because they are also um, um, forward-looking and really recommending uh, changes to way, the way in which we deal with this part of the system. It's not the whole system, but it's but it's an important part of it. I mean, in, in our as Don was pointing out, in our legal system, judges and prosecutors and lawyers, you know, on, on the defense side, play an important role in keeping the system working. But if you don't give those judges, those prosecutors, and involve lawyers, um, and not just lawyers, but but others who are in, involved in, in in the representation, um, nothing will work. Uh, so I, I I think when we step back and we look at this report, um, it deals with this problem in a very honest way, in a very detailed way, and I think it's the first time that we have ever seen it done in this comprehensive in such a comprehensive way. Um, but let's not be uh, naive and let's not um, say that this is, you know, that if we do all these things, our problems are all going to go away. If we don't deal with the underlying issue of serious reform, we will be faced with this problem again and again. So thank you and, and kudos to for, for a wonderful uh, study and report and, and recommendations and happy to have been part of this. Thank you, Professor. Just to remind everyone, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box and we will turn to those after we turn to our uh, members of our expert advisory group who help advise the paper and uh, provide their expertise to the paper. Uh, we have several members who are online with us and I perhaps will first uh, call on Michelle Pistone uh, from the University of Villanova School of Law to um, give her comments. Welcome, Michelle. Thanks, Kevin, and thanks to Don and Evan for this great report. I agree that um, it's a really impactful study, and I'm just like very grateful to CMS for doing the hard work that's necessary for us to make progress in immigration. So you know, I'm a law professor, and I've at Villanova ran a clinic in which my students and I provided legal representation in immigration court. And so the thing that struck me about the report and just about this backlog is to understand the impact that it has on representation. Like we've been talking a lot about legal representation in the context of immigration and how it's really one of the biggest issues impacting immigration today. And the backlog compounds the lack of, of legal representation in part because it's really challenging for people to take on as lawyers, to take on a case and not know when it's gonna be adjudicated, not know as Don said, whether it's gonna be adjudicated in a year or up to three years or longer. And so, you know, in it, there's been a really huge effort among legal services organizations over the last few years to recruit pro bono lawyers and others to do these cases. And yet, if there's no and if there's no predictability in the system, it makes it really hard to get the type of representation that we need. And as um, judge the judge said, this impacts children as well, many of whom are appearing in court without any advocacy. And we all we know from EOIR and others that everyone in the system benefits from having lawyers. 
So it's just an or or advocates, including you know lawyers and accredited representatives, which is something that I've been working on recently to build up the capacity of fully accredited representatives so they can become part of the solution as well. But I think you know this the backlog is a huge part of figuring of the problems that we have in legal representation. And so again, thanks to the to CMS for doing this, for leading our efforts in this area. Before I go to other members uh, of the advisory group, let me judge uh, Zankoff. I know you have limited time. I don't know if you've left us or if you're still with us. She might have. She might have left. I was going to add. There was a question that was tailored for her, but I'll save it for the other panelists. Um, Anna Gallagher from the Catholic Legal Immigration Network uh, would like to say a few words. And thank you so much, Kevin. Um, I apologize. I'm at a conference and sort of in transit, and and wanted to be part of this and participate. So thank you so much to Don, to Evan for your leadership on this. Um, to my committee members, some of the smartest people in the field that I know, it's a pleasure and honor to serve with you. And then um, I'd just like to share that I'm the executive director of the Catholic Legal Immigration Network, and our mission is to expand immigration legal services. Don was a, a past executive director. Um, and I would just urge, it, urge people and emphasize the importance of non-lawyers in this process and being part of the solution. Um, a, the, the, the greatest part, we have 470 affiliates, NGOs across the country that provide immigration legal services to poor and low-income immigrants. Um, and the majority of the folks that are working in our affiliates are accredited reps. They are an important, important part of expanding immigration legal services. Also, we're learning um, the importance of systems and the use of technology in expanding legal services as an old-time lawyer. I realize face-to-face -face is not going to happen as much, right? But how do we use uh, how do we use technology to expand? We just finished up a, a an excellent two-day uh, meeting uh, led by Michelle Villanova and MIT about systems design. So it's exciting to be a part of that. And COVID certainly gave us the opportunity to be creative in some ways in expanding and the need to think how we reach our people, especially we were uh, working with uh, uh, our folks in the border, a project in the border, and completely changed our view of how to do consultations, how to access people, et cetera. So just wanted to note, note, note that we need to think outside the box. So, so grateful to CMS, so grateful to Judge Sankov and to the Immigration Corps and to David Neal for all the work they do and all the grief they take. Um, so um, thank you so much. Thank you, Anna. Any other members of the advisory group who would like to speak before we go to questions? Uh, Kevin, this is Greg Chen with Ayla. I don't know if you can Greg. see me on the screen here. We can. Uh, so I'm happy to make some comments briefly. Uh, again, uh, as others remarked a moment ago, uh, I was really pleased to be able to be part of uh, this important group pulling to get together this report. And thanks to Center for Migration Studies for really dedicating the resources to look at this important issue. Uh, the, the main thing that I would highlight here uh, from the American Immigration Lawyers Association perspective is uh, the, the top line recommendation and focus of this report uh, to emphasize the concern about uh, the backlog of the court, uh, which is very much drowning, uh, or the dumping ground metaphors, but the, the court's, uh, the paper's title uses. This is something AILA has uh, been focused on for a long time, not just in the court context, but also for other immigration agency concerns, particularly USCIS. Uh, the fact is that in the past decade, the backlogs in both of those agencies have escalated dramatically. Uh, and the, the report nicely pointed out why that is causing so many problems for the court systematically or systemically. Uh, one of the recommendations that is hi highlighted in the report that I want to uh, illuminate more is a set of recommendations that AILA and the Cardozo Law School team pulled together, uh, which was to look at cases that are essentially being handled duplicatively by both USCIS and the courts. Uh, and if you want to make systems more efficient, why have two agencies looking at the same case at the same time, when in many of these cases, by our estimate, it was well over 600,000 cases uh, that could have been handled just by USCIS because there was a petition pending before them and it shouldn't be taking up court time. Uh, we appreciate that 
uh, this report uh, continues to push forward solutions in that regard. I'm aware that UIR has actually been implementing smart docketing practices to try to handle this. Uh, so I think that will do so much to try to alleviate the pressure on the courts. Uh, the, the fact is that the courts just can't handle the volume coming in and there have to be smarter decisions made as to which cases are handled. Uh, the only other uh, point that I would mention is Ayla's abiding concern about uh, the court ensuring it implement reforms to restore uh, due process into the court system. Uh, and while we've seen a few of the opinions that former attorneys general Sessions and Barr uh, had implemented, uh, that those have been rescinded under President Biden, uh, there are still many, many more that undermine asylum access and also continue to strip judges of their most basic fundamental authorities uh, to manage their docket. Uh, and without those authorities, and in particular, I'm talking about one which makes it much more difficult for judges to grant continuances, which is a functionally important docket management strategy to not have a case come up in front of you and waste your time as judge if it's not appropriate. Uh, that judges don't have the same ability to grant any longer. Uh, so those are just a few examples. Uh, but I'm just very appreciative of the fact that uh, this report highlights and brings together so many of those themes. And I commend it both for policymakers as well as folks within government that are looking at what steps to take. Thank you, Greg. Uh, any other members of the advisory group online who want to speak? Hearing none, we'll proceed to questions. Uh, I have a question off the top. Um, for anyone who wants to answer it. You know, it, it seems as though the focus of our debate in this country is now turned to the southern border. Can anyone speak to how reform of the immigration court system uh, would if, would affect the situation at the border? Um, you know, our immigration systems, like the human body, everything's sort of connected. Um, we don't always see the whole, the whole system, though. Um, what impact would it have on, on the border situation um, that we see today? Kevin, I think the, um, and everybody should jump in on all of these questions, of course. Um, I think what the, what the report is pointing to is that you, what you've had since the creation of DHS is the growth of the immigration enforcement system. And yet you still have what's happening at the Southern border. What you haven't seen is you haven't seen the development of, a, of an immigration court system that's independent, that's well-resourced, that can efficiently adjudicate cases, that honors, you know, kind of due process across the board, um, and, that, and that's able to operate as a court system without political interference in an independent way. So, I mean, the, the question is, why not give that a try, you know? It's not, it's not an either or, of course, but we know that th there's been huge amounts of resources poured into immigration enforcement, and you still have what's happening there, partially because of um, you know the the causes of these situations, but also the court system and the the fact that it's under resourced, um, and f and all the other kind of problems that the this long report details haven't been addressed, um, and the basic reform of the immigration system hasn't taken place in decades now. You know, what is it, almost 60 years for the legal immigration system. I think, you know, 37 years since it's been overhauled, since the, and nothing on dream, nothing on um, fix 96, none of these, none of these other issues. So, um, so give it a try, you know, it's the, it's the, it's the weak part of the puzzle at this point, but that's, kind of, it's weak because everything has um, conspired against it and it really needs to be invested in a very significant way. Kevin, may I jump in here? Go ahead. Uh, I'm sure I can't be as eloquent as the way Don just described it there, but it may be in more simple terms, I would just say, you know, the courts are the left hand of the right hand that is the enforcement mechanism of the uh, other parts of the Department of Homeland Security and immigration agencies. So if the left hand isn't functioning, the right hand is going to get backlogged. Uh, and that's as simple as it is. And there is so much emphasis right now on uh, what is happening at this U.S. southern border as if all of immigration policy happens only in one region of the United States without looking at a systemic analysis of the fact that all agencies need to be functioning. 
Uh, and we've seen it recently with the court system scrambling to increase its ability to review uh, expedited cases that are coming in the border region. And judges are being pulled off of their current dockets and asked to be able to do quick reviews of these expedited cases. It's called expedited removal. It's a credible fear interview that they are having done for the respondent that first comes in at the border. Uh, but then if that case is uh, goes up to the court, the court has to handle it very rapidly. And we're seeing judges being pulled off their regular dockets to be able to go and handle uh, these uh, credible fear interview reviews themselves uh, on an expedited basis. And because the court's already backlogged, that's going to further delay the overall process. But it's because the courts are to backlog that uh, on the other side of the equation, the enforcement mechanism also feels pressure to do things such as detain people for a longer period of time because there isn't faith that the case will be resolved in anything less than, as Don and everybody else has already said, and Kevin, four, five, six years for a case to be resolved. And that's uh, not going to be adequate, uh, acceptable from a political viewpoint. And that's what drives political pressure on the system. Thanks, Greg. I think the other the other thing, just one other thing to add to this, and that is that um, the problems at the border um, are driven largely by points that, that Don um, has has made and and Greg has alluded to, which is that we're these about their root causes for this problem, and it's not going to be answerable just by dealing with uh, um, dealing with the backlog. Because if we focus on dealing with the backlog, then we're talking about efficiencies and efficiencies, or we're humanitarian considerations fall by the wayside. And so I'd be, um, that's how, how we approach the system of, of asylum and humanitarian protection. And then also looking at root causes for why people are making this move coupled with the problem of the pandemic and the, basically the, the, the breakdown of the, of the, of the entire system um, that happened in the last four years. Let's move to, uh, thank you, Professor. Let's move to some of the questions in the in the chat box. Um, from Julia Preston of the Marshall Project, she asks, there is a broad agreement that there are systemic crises in the immigration system. How do you see getting Congress to move towards solutions? And aren't you just going around in circles if you keep signaling the system scale of the problem and there is no movement toward reform? I guess it's the general what can we, how can we get Congress to act question? I mean, I, I just think that this is uh, one of those issues that has a little bit for everybody in it. You know, there's people that are, I mean, think about the hundreds of thousands that have come in the last couple of years, asylum seekers, humanitarian parolees, other arrivals. Some people are arguing that those people aren't most of them aren't legitimate asylum seekers. Some people are opposed to the admission of folks who have been, and you know, have entered legally at this point and are waiting in the court system. Others have argued that they are. I mean, I, I think everybody ought to be on the same page in terms of this immigration court system. Though it needs to be able to resolve these cases in an accurate way that honors due process that's you know, as expeditious as it can be consistent with due process and, uh, and that makes fair and the right decisions under the law such as it exists. You know, like I, don't, I think that that's, that ought to be, uh, it might be ridiculous to think that, that, could, that there could be bipartisan support for that, but why, why couldn't there be? You know? And I think um, this is what I meant by kind of a good government problem. You know? People are going to disagree about the types of judges and various things. It's going to be hard not to politicize an immigration issue, but this is really one that really it really requires fixing. It needs it's a missing piece, and it's a missing piece for enforcement oriented people, and it's a missing piece for you know civil libertarians and asylum um, advocates, etc. Thank you, Don. Uh, we have a, a follow-up question from Julia Preston. Um, there have been multiple efforts to use prosecutorial discretion to reduce the backlogs, but attorneys are reluctant to go there because it tends to leave immigrants in legal limbo with no work authorization. What would you do differently about this issue? 
I mean, I can I can speak to these, but please, um, Michelle and Greg and Richard, please please jump in. But I I think you know we're we're cognizant of that particular situation. We do think, and thanks to Greg for lifting this up and for his previous work with Peter Markowitz and others on identifying groups that ought to be subject to um, ought to be low priority cases and ought to be subject to an exercise of prosecutorial discretion. We think that there are large numbers of people in the in the kinds of categories that they've identified and that we were able to affirm, you know, that there's there's significant numbers that ought to be subject to that shouldn't be in the court system at all. Um, I think though that there will be cases in prosecutorial discretion where people who otherwise would be able to seek relief in immigration court wouldn't if they're cut out of the court system. So we're making recommendations like there ought to be an affirmative suspension of um, removal type of system where people that would be cut out would be able to apply affirmatively based on their equitable ties to the United States and get status that way. So they don't have to do it through the court system. They can do it administratively. So there's a lot of proposals like that in this um, in this report that come from you know other sources and you know our colleagues who are part of this advisory group and so we're quite cognizant of that. I don't and I and I should say this. I think prosecutorial discretion is a big part of the solution, but I don't think, as Richard said, it's any one thing. It's all of these things in combination. The problem is that severe at this point. I'm happy to jump in with just a quick comment, although I think Don really summed it up very nicely there. Uh, but Julie, in answer to your question, uh, first of all, I would just distinguish uh, the term prosecutor discretion is typically one that judges uh, do not embrace because they are not prosecutors. Uh, the And so many of the strategies or docket management choices that uh, the Executive Office for Immigration Review would be doing uh, may be seen from kind of a layperson's perspective as ways to uh, manage cases that don't need to be taking time and are not a priority in terms of whether it's appropriate for the court to be using its time on something that's actually pending before USCIS. I think I might normally think of that as a similar kind of uh, exercise of a system's uh, effective use of its limited and finite resources uh, in the way that, let's say, ICE may think of it uh, as prosecutor for discretion, but I don't think the courts use that term. But if I think for layperson's perspective, uh, they are very similar analogous concepts. Uh, and then beyond the definitional issue, uh, to maybe amplify Don's point, just is, is, and that's to say that there are tools uh, at the court's disposal uh, for disposing of cases or uh, taking them off the docket so it doesn't occupy court time, and that's an effective management strategy that would allow for uh, the person to be able to uh, get some kind of uh, more permanent status. Uh, I don't mean that a permanent legal status, but to obtain, let's say, a work permit or to have their case proceed forward and not be stuck in a permanent limbo. I, I think that was one of the concerns that you were you were giving voice to. But there are definitely categories of cases, especially those with cases pending before USCIS, where that is certainly possible. Thanks, Greg. Um, Sorry. Greg, you touched upon this next one. Um, given that the majority of cases going into that court system are coming from a pre unprecedented number of asylum cases at the border, do you believe the role of the immigration courts in deciding border asylum cases should be limited? And I know, Greg, you touched upon that. Did anyone want to expand on that? or? Nobody else wants to dive in. Um, I, I guess I will just say that, I guess it depends on what the question intends by limiting the role of the courts here. So first of all, I would say that uh, the you know, in statute, there are going to be specific uh, legal requirements to protect the fairness uh, and due process for the individual who's going through the proceeding. And so if we're talking about cutting off access to, let's say, the opportunity for somebody to seek a review of a decision by an asylum officer that uh, an asylum seeker coming in is does not have a fear of uh, persecution. I would not want that to be limited um, if, if that's what we're talking about here. Uh, but if we're talking about ways to improve mechanisms, uh, I think there are lots of ways to do this uh, that could reduce impact and burden on the courts. 
one very specific proposal has actually been implemented by the Biden administration last May of 2022 with a regulation, and that was to expand the ability and authority of Assam officers to not only do an initial screening of somebody for Assam uh, in this context, but also to go ahead and proceed to uh, doing a full grant of asylum and reviewing the case at that level, if that's appropriate. Uh, that was something that AILA supported, other organizations or experts actually that are in this space here um, have recommended it. Um, AILA has some real concerns about that May 2022 regulation that the Biden administration implemented uh, because it truncated the process severely uh, and set deadlines that makes it uh, extremely difficult for a person to be able to uh, have the opportunity to prepare their case and present it in a fair proceeding before the court. Uh, so we have concerns about that, but the concept of having asylum officers handle the case and uh, reduce the workload on courts, I think is a very good one. And perhaps um, I've misunderstood the question, but um, um, I think we need to be clear that the problems that that we're talking about have been longstanding and they preceded what's happening at the border now. The problems at the border now exacerbate this backlog issue, but that this, these are longstanding, you know, structural problems that the system has had for a long, long time, which preceded, you know, what's what we're seeing at the border now, if that's what the, uh, the commenter or the questioner was, um, was posing. Okay, um, our next question is, uh, I believe it goes to the recommendation on a new independent immigration court. It says, I am assuming immigration courts independent of the DOJ would still fall under the executive branch in some form. If so, what is the best way to avoid politic politicization and its impact on the courts? Sorry for that, politicization. Politicizing the court. How do you keep a, the court independent without any political pressure? I don't know. I, I, I think that the um, that uh, what's what's been articulated here is a separate court that would not be the, under the arm of the executive. It would be the um, uh, Article Three. Is that what we're talking about? You know, I keep getting all the articles all mixed up. Article I One. Article One. <laughs> um, but that that's what it's it's more like a, like a bankruptcy court um, and not part an arm of the DOJ, not an arm of the DHS, not an arm of the State Department, but a separate, a separate court. So it would be independent and would have broader authority that the judges would have to make to make decisions. And they would be independent and they would probably also have more discretion um, and, and and other kinds of tools that they could have to resolve cases. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Richard's right, exactly right. It's a um it's they're called legislative courts, actually. So it's we're not talking about placing it in the Department of Justice or DHS or the Department of Labor or wherever it might be. It would be kind of an independent tribunal. Um, I I think it yes, it's not likely that um, it would be wholly immune from political issues. For example, you know, in the selection of judges and and the like, you know, there'd be advice and consent going on, but I, but I, but it would be more independent and would operate more independently. And the thought is that it would um, have more prestige, more funding. Uh, it would be less, it would be more immune from political pressures. But you know, it's hard. It would be hard to imagine any kind of immigration issue at this point being totally hermetically sealed from what's going on on immigration. I, I interrupted you there, Michelle, I think. Sorry. Um, no, you covered what I wanted to say. Thanks. A small point just to add on to that is that the uh, uh, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren of California in the last Congress did, in fact, introduce a bill uh, called the Real Courts uh, Act. I don't maybe I missed that being mentioned earlier. Uh, and that does exactly what uh, Professor Boswell and Don just mentioned a moment ago. Uh, and it would create it under Article One, at the, and that's the general concept of a legislative court. So it's no longer under the executive branch. Uh, AILA has endorsed that bill, uh, and it's also public that the National Association of Immigration Judges, the ABA, and the Federal Bar Association have endorsed that particular bill. 
uh, and, and we think that would do uh, leaps and bounds in terms of increasing independence of the court. Uh, I don't think there exists a hermetically sealed court institution in our country at this point, as reporting may even show now on institutions as heralded as the Supreme Court, uh, but I think they will take huge steps uh, in that direction. I have a question from Jan Swordson Druber. Uh, does the current immigration court system state any, quote, principles of morality and justice, unquote, that are agreed upon above the level of political control over the Department of Justice? I guess the question is, what are the principles by which the immigration courts adjudicate, and does that insulate them in any way from any level of political control? I think, all, <laughs> I, I, I think all employees of the Department of Justice take an oath. Um, the problem is, is that, um, that uh, immigration judges have a lot limited authority and um, they don't have control of their, of, of, over their cases. And they have a, a law that they, they're basically an, an arm of the, of the prosec or they're viewed as an arm of the prosecution by the, uh, by the DOJ. And that's why they're they're being moved around in the way in which they are. Um, but yes, I think all lawyers who work for the DOJ take an oath and are bound by that oath. But the problem is, is you know that they don't have all the tools to to deal with uh, what what they're confronted with. I mean, I think that the um, that that's that's correct. And but I think that you know. The judges do value due process quite a bit. Certainly, their union does. And um, in the mission statement of EOIR, it talks about the purpose of the court system is to fairly, okay, that's there's that's a due process word, expeditiously and uniformly administer and interpret U.S. immigration laws. So I, um, I think there's broad support for among, at least among the judges for kind of you know. A level of due process in these cases. There needs to be, of course, more. And the proposal actually, or the paper actually, calls for some kind of um, universal representation program with government at government expense for indigent people. That it argues that it would be really impossible in these cases where you have a essentially a prosecutor to to have due process without representation and cases of this complexity with such you know grave consequences for people so and i think that there's a lot of support for that idea what yeah. where where, the, where there would be a breakdown is like who would pay for it i guess yeah and the support you know immigration judges the have themselves said that it makes the court so much more efficient and effective when people are represented um, and so has EOIR, you know, the, the, um, the head of EOIR has said that as well. You know, and there are also parts of the system that were not meant to be adversarial, and that's part of the, uh, the asylum adjudication uh, part, which has been really pushed over more into uh, the adversarial system of the immigration courts. And if you had a system that would adjudicate asylum um, in a non-adversarial manner, um, you might have, you know, it, it, it might help help some of this too. So it's, that's why I think the important part of this report is that it says that this is not the silver bullet, but that we have to deal with all these other broader, broader, broader questions. But there's, you know. We have a few minutes left, so I'll, we'll have, we'll take one or two more questions, uh, and then I'll invite anyone for last comments. Uh, our next question is the report recommends limiting new NTAs each year until the backlog is managed. But how does that work when arrivals at the border who are not removed or withdraw must be placed into proceedings, which is the majority of the new cases? I mean, I, I, I think what the report argues is that it's a it's farcical to like Last year, for example, I think 313,000 cases were completed and 706,000 were put into proceedings. It doesn't, it doesn't serve anybody's interest to put that many people whose cases now in some courts, it's gonna be a decade before they're actually um, 
um, there, those, those cases are actually considered, you know? So um, the idea behind the report is that you have to staff up very, very significantly. You have to do the kinds of refor uh, legislative reform that's necessary to reduce pressure on the court, to reduce pressure on the enforcement system. And at, and at some point you have to reverse and ultimately eliminate the backlog and then start over again because it's, um, because it's untenable. And our, our last question is from Ann Lalena. <clears throat> what are the next steps for CMS and all groups who had folks working on the report to make the report's recommendations a reality? Will you advocate for this at DHS, at DHS and the Hill, et cetera? And uh, first thing I would say is there are groups that have been doing this. Um, Greg mentioned a bill last year that Representative Lofgren put in which had quite a few endorsements. But um, as far as CMS is concerned, it's not something that we're going to put on the shelf. Certainly, we'll be getting it before members of Congress, before the executive branch as well, um, as much as possible, and get it into the mix of comprehensive immigration reform, which hopefully Congress will address at some point in the near future. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, I think that's one of the greatest things about the Journal on Migration and Human Security, that it we it has recommendations and that the CMS sees it as a vehicle for making legislative and other reform. And so um, it's just kind of how CMS thinks about what it does with the reports. We do, it's not an organization that just kind of writes things, <laughs> but it's not, you know, it's it's writing and then action behind it. Any other thoughts on that? Okay, well, we we're, we have a few minutes left. I was wondering if anyone wanted to make a comment or conclu conclusion to our, to our webinar today. They want to make some final comments about the report and about looking forward. I mean, one thing is I would recommend that people share it widely within their own networks, because I think what we really need in order to make the type of changes that we're talking about here, we need to build coalition support behind these ideas. And it has mm -hmm. to be beyond just like the people who are already in the room. So like share it with people outside the room so that we so that, uh, you know, I think a lot of people who aren't embedded in the immigration justice system do not understand the nature of these problems. And I feel like this report does such a good job of like making those ideas and those realities accessible. I mean, just the funding question alone, you know, I think tells a lot about the, the imbalance here. And so spread the word, <laughs> that would be my, my uh, last point. Thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I guess, I guess I, I first of all, thanks to, Michelle and Richard and Anna and Mimi and Greg and all all of you, Kevin and Evan, you know, for all of the, your support and guidance on on this report. It's, it's really been invaluable. I I think just to maybe close from my perspective, it's um it's an enormous issue. It's it's an issue that's not getting sufficient attention. Everything's on enforcement. And this one needs to be it needs to be resolved and it needs really serious attention or we're not going to be able to address this situation oh. that, that, you know, has happened over the last several years at this point of asylum seekers, humanitarian parolees, mm -hmm. Afghans, I mean, all these huge populations that have come in, be impossible to address them successfully if this isn't, this isn't addressed, this problem. And it's really central to the immigration system, really central to it. Um, an ignored issue that needs to get attention. And that's what the report is trying to do. It's trying to get it attention, meaningful attention. I think finally, I mean, there really are human consequences here. There's real mm -hmm. life at stake. Millions of, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, of course, in the backlog and their family members and others on the way. So it, it, it badly needs to be addressed and hopefully can be addressed in a way that's not, you know, partisan. Yes. Anna Gallagher, you, you're going to have the last word. Oh, my. 
Oh my, well, thank you so much, folks. It's just been a pleasure and an honor. And I was just thinking how important it is that we are allies of our immigration judges and the immigration court system at EUIR. And we also, those of us mm -hmm. that are in the field, make sure we say that over and over and over again, because the title of this is bold and it's true. The dumping ground and the immigration judges become the scapegoat for such a much bigger program. Mm -hmm. And the word that keeps jumping out to me in my head is integrity. You know, how we, we do not have a system of integrity if we have a million cases pending and it takes three to five to 10 years to adjudicate. My last pro bono case, I am on year 10 and she deserved to be granted in the very beginning. So year 10. Um, so there's threats, you know, there's serious threats. And what Don said, there's human consequences to this. Um, and so I just want to thank you, Don, Evan, this, this committee, and um, I will socialize this, we'll share, and I hope we can come together and actually talk. I'd be curious to talk and interested in talking about maybe some next action steps. So thank you, folks, and thank you to all who attended. Thank you, Kevin, for leading us and organizing and herding the cats. Thanks, Anna. Okay, everyone, the, the report can be found at our website, cmsny.org, and we'll also be posting the recording. So uh, please share that with colleagues and anyone that you know on the Hill or in the administration. We'd really appreciate it. And thanks to our panelists today for your expertise. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.